Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Whatever time of day you are listening to this podcast, I am hoping it has been a good day so far for you. Hey, welcome to Jesus and Current Events. And with I am the host, David Balzer, but I have the man of the hour. His name is Randy McGacky. Is that right? Is that is that properly pronounced? Because I don't want to. Because I just I just found out that you know his given name is Randon, not Randy uh, McGacky. So uh, yes, this is our seventh podcast together, and we are planning on doing seventy. You know, we're 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 going to continue to go and go and go, and we hope that as not we hope we believe that you're listening for a reason, and Randy has come into this place with a word from God. And so that's how we're going to approach not only tonight, but every night. So you know what? I'm not going to go through the preliminaries that I usually do tonight. We feel a little stirred up. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, So go ahead, Randy. Hey, okay. Let's start out with some good scriptures to start off with. This is in John 3, 6, or well, John 3, verses 15 is where I'll start. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, or Zoe life, or the God kind of life. For God so loved the world, and I'm emphasizing the world, so he loves each and every person in this world, no matter who they are, what they've done, or where they've been. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, or that Zoe, or the God kind of life. God coming and living on the inside. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, hmm. but that the world through him might be saved or delivered or set free. Amen. Okay, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest or unless their deeds should be removed. So I want to bring out that God so loves every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. That's why he sent Jesus. Amen. And he didn't just send them to forgive our sins. He sent them to remove our sins. Amen. So he wants to set us free from those temptations, those uh, lusts, those desires. He didn't just come to cover over, wipe out what we did in the past. He wants to set us free from that. For me, my main thing I needed delivered from was the booze. I did other drugs, but my main drug of choice was booze. But he came to set me free from that. He didn't come to punish me for it. He came to set me free from it. Mm. Okay, that isn't the scriptures where we're, I was planning on starting with. And I'm sh- not sure where we're going tonight as us telling day beforehand. I was beat, whipped, and wore out from chipping ice for the last three days. <laughs> My body's tired and hurting. And, and I feel like I told him as anointed as a goose. But God's word's always anointed. So always. we're going to see what God's word can do. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so the scripture that I wanted to start out with is 2 Peter chapter 2. And I was only going to read verse 1, but I'm doing a Ken Copeland here. The more I look, the more I'm going. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) So if you got your Bibles, turn there. If you got your iPhones or iPods or whatever, turn to that or iPads whatever you're looking at, but there, and I'm reading out the NIV right now. In fact, Dave, if, would you like to read tonight? I could, wor- Second Peter what? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. And, and verses 1 through 3. All right. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, 
They will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Okay. Uh, last week, I didn't even realize this, but we were given statistics. I guess I already have it out. About uh, how many Republicans, how many Democrats were on each side of the aisle that it says roughly, and this was, uh, what was the poll? Somebody, uh, what, 82 or something like that? Yeah, 88% of the House and the Senate professed to be Christians. And the results were, and I'll just do the House, that... I don't know how many House members there are total. It's 400 and some. But anyhow, in the House, there was 175 Democrats and 208 Republicans. Okay, of Baptists, 25 were Democrats and 30 were Republicans. Of the Methodists, 17 were Democrats and 12 were Republicans. And then there's other ones, Presbyterians, five Democrat, Republic, or Presbyterians, seven Republicans. Okay. Uh, and most of us are starting to find out where the Democrats stand. I will say maybe some of the ones that voted with the Democrats, they did not, under, not understand what Biden and the left was actually putting up, but I can't really think they didn't. <laughs> but... I will say a lot of the voters, they probably did not fully understand what exactly the left is pushing. But there are going to be false teachers and false prophets. And this is Peter talking about in the future, and he's talking about the end times. But there were also false prophets among the people, and we're going to turn to those scriptures. That was over in Numbers 24, where we will turn and we'll read that story in a little bit. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies in the church. They're going to preach things that's telling us that things that God calls evil and sin, they're going to call good and godly. And they're going to pervert righteousness. And over in Isaiah chapter 5, I think it is, it says in the end that they will call evil good and good evil and That is really what we see happening in our world system, and here especially in the United States. And the bad thing about the United States, we were the ones that provided most of the world with evangelism throughout the whole world. That is partly what our nation was founded on, was so we could preach the gospel throughout the whole world. It was brought over here so we could preach to the natives over here, and then from here it was supposed to go out and spread throughout the whole earth. And that's pretty much that has been what's happening. But now we have nations send an evangelist into the United States to witness to us, which is supposedly supposed to be a Christian nation, and it says 88% of our uh, House and Senate, they profess to be Christians. I'm going to question that. It depends on what they're calling Christians. If they're Christians because their mom and dad was raised in church or whatever, But a Christian, it means to be Christ-like. That's what the word Christ ends is, is we are followers of Christ or we are like Christ. And the word Christ is not Jesus' first name or his last (laughs) name. Uh, I know this is controversial with some people and it's going to strike people, but it is not his first name or his last name. That word Christ means the anointed one, and it was what he was anointed to do. So every time I read my Bible, whenever I see that word Christ, I put that in there. Jesus, the anointed one, and what he was anointed to do, and it brings a whole new meaning to that scripture. So that's a, one of those little Bible tricks if you want to try to start using it for yourself. It brings a whole new meaning to the scripture that you're reading. But Jesus was the Christ, and what was he anointed to do? He was anointed to go forth and set the captives free, to give sight to the blind. So he came to set us free from our sins, not to just tell us, well, you're okay, I love you. He does love us, but he loves us enough he wants to change us, that those things that have us bound and are hurting us and hurting others, he wants to set us free from that. 
That is his main purpose in this life. And that word save is more than just, uh, we get to die and go to heaven. Amen. It sure is. <laughs> and our sins are forgiven. They're not only forgiven, he came to cleanse us from our sins, to set us free from them, so we could walk and be like he did here on this earth. So that word save is the word sozo, and it means to deliver, to heal, to uh, make us whole in our spirit, in our soul, in our body, financially and socially. He came to set us free from all the things that Adam and his original sin brought that curse into the earth. He Absolutely. came to set us free. Absolutely. Okay. That but, word sa- saved has been stolen from the church. Yes. That word has only been used for the saving of the soul. And, and, and the majority of people that, that I have talked with over the years pastoring, they don't even, they don't, they don't have a clue. And when you teach on that, they almost look at you sideways like, there's more to this than just saving of my soul? Absolutely. Yes. The saving of your soul is the initial key if you you know if you look if you want to use an example into the kingdom. The Bible says we cannot see the kingdom unless we be born again or unless yes. one is born again yes, you amen. cannot see the kingdom. So yeah, so I'll just stop there but yeah, sozo and it's also a present progressive term which means we're being saved now, we're being saved Now, we're being saved now with the same (laughs) saving power that we had when we first got saved. Hopefully that makes sense out there. It might not, but I'm just telling you, the same faith it takes you to get saved is the exact same faith it takes you to receive anything in the kingdom because it all comes by grace. And grace Grace. is always available, and it is always as powerful as it was. In fact, grace was powerful before you accepted it. Amen. Grace is like gravity. It is present anywhere you are. That's why the Bible says uh, in Romans chapter 10, just kind of go here a little bit. Romans chapter 10 says, the word is nigh me in my mouth and in my heart. The word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt believe in thy heart, and confess out the mouth, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, but with mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Sozo. Delivered. So you don't just call on the name of the Lord, because we talk a little about, we'll talk about relationship later, but you just don't call upon the Lord one time, punch your ticket for heaven. You call upon the Lord every day to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, Amen. to be prosperous, to be all of those things. And uh, we're going to recapture that word. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Okay. So what I was pulling out of this, but there will also be, there was also false prophets among the people, just as there were false teachers among you. So there are false teacher and false prophets among us. And as we saw last week, or we brought up last week, that 72% of the church does not believe the Bible is officially the inspired word of God, that it is not the final rule of everything that we say and everything that we do, that it is just kind of like a floating document and it just fits however it fits. It's, and we make it fit however we want it to make it fit. No. God's word is the final authority on everything. So this is what we are going on, and we find out that, hey, a lot of church does not believe this is God's official word for us today. It's history book. It can be other things to a lot of people, but it is not necessarily the official word. So that's number one thing we're trying to get out there in the reality of life, that this is truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Amen. And it is the final rule of everything that we say and everything that we do. So even though somebody says, makes a law and says something is good, does not necessarily make it good. Like they're trying to make pot legal here as a recreational drug. Well, we already got enough alcoholics out mm. there. Do we need a bunch of stoneheads driving around on the roads too? Uh, whenever you look at the statistics, and whenever you see somebody died in a car wreck, it one out of either the person driving on either side of it was drunk. That one out of every 
two accidents. Somebody was invo- involved in that accident was somebody who was drinking. So whenever there is a fatality, same way with boat accidents. Whenever somebody, you hear of a death in a boat accident, chances are 50-50 chance somebody was drinking in that situation. Now we want to make pot legal. Does that make it right? Alcohol is legal. Does that make it good? No. It tells us about drunkenness all through the Bible. It warns us about that. Okay, whenever you see the word sorcery, the word sorcery or witchcraft, whichever word you want to use, whichever version you're reading, that word is pharmakia, where we get the word pharmacy from, where we get pharmaceutical drugs from. There are a lot of people that are drug addicted that have been ordered by doctors to take the pills or the medicines. They're running around high, buzzed up on Pills that they think are supposed to be doing them good. I'm not saying throw your medications out the window. You still need to follow your doctor. Amen. I am not a doctor. But there are a lot of people who take drugs that it is because their doctor prescribed it to them because he doesn't know any other way of healing. The first thing, if you're a Christian and you need healing, it tells us over in James to call upon the elders of the church, have them anoint you with oil, and a prayer of faith shall save the sick. It didn't say maybe or might. It said shall save the sick. That's the first thing any Christian ought to do is, Father, how should I know it's not your will for me to be going through this situation. What should I do? There's other ways of receiving healing, too. You can receive healing through taking communion at home. Sometimes you go to a church that may not believe in James one twenty one. <laughs> so what do you do in that situation? Well, God's got a way of getting healing to you in every way. Mm, he I may like tell you to go to a doctor. If he does tell you to go to a doctor, the, my point in this one is, The first thing you should do is turn to God and find out what he wants you to do. Not make up your mind, well, oh, I got whatever. May got the coronavirus. I better get to the doctor, the hospital. Well, uh, maybe God will tell you to go to the hospital. Maybe he'll tell you to go to the doctor. But you ought to turn to him first before you go doing it. Because there's all kinds of examples through the Bible, and I don't have their names off the top in the Old Testament, that the one king that... He was one of the godly kings. I got it in my notes there, but I can't remember his name. Uh, which Josiah, one maybe? I don't think it was Hezekiah? Josiah. Because he was, uh, no. Well, Hezekiah was a screw up, too. No, well, he was. <laughs> but he also did good things. Yeah. Did we pop a breaker? No, that thing goes off and on all the time. It does. <laughs> okay. Well, I might we not just, read a whole lot. We just set the mood in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do we turn those <laughs> lights on? Ah, uh, you just plug it in. Well, while he's getting ready to pr- plug in some more light, so we can get some light in the room, I want to read you. I want to read you um, the definition of of, of heresies, because uh, okay. in my in my Bible, uh, in my New King James New King James Bible, I got the Study Bible here. It's called the New Spirit-Filled Life Bible. I love it. It's got word wealth, kingdom dynamics, all kinds of things. But breaking down this word heresies, because we're talking about in that time, they had her- people who were heretical or teaching things that were not truth. Okay? Teaching things that were not truth. And so this is a definition. It's Strong's um, number 139 for all you guys out there. You can look it up in Strong's and Coordinates. You can Google it, whatever. It, it is um, compare heresy and heretical from I cannot pronounce the the word. It's spelled H A I R E M A A, and it means to choose. So the word originally denoted making a choice or having an option, progressing to having a preference because of an opinion. Listen here, or a sentiment. It is easily slipped into a mode of disunity, choosing sides, having diversity of belief, creating dissension, and submitting, substituting self-willed opinions for the submission to truth. Yes. The dominant use in the New Testament is to signify sex or people professing opinions independent of of the truth. What do we have, people? Come on out there in podcast land. What do we have out there? If 72% of people, not Christians, 
Okay. But people who go to church don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Every jot, every tittle is the inspired word of God. That's Jesus' words there, in case you don't know that. He said every dot, jot, and every tittle, right? Uh, that he would fulfill. So every part and partial of the word of God, every stroke of the pen, if I had a, if I had a, like a Jewish theologian or even theologians, they, they, I can only give you a brief synopsis of it. They believed even writing the very words was a holy thing. Amen. And they would have to take another, they would, they would write a little bit or they'd write a letter, take another pen, write a letter. Like every word was, uh, like every syllable was, holy. They approach the word of God. I mean, come on, guys. I mean, we are way away from that. How many times do we open up our word? Me included, man. I'm not pointing fingers. And we just begin to read. We begin to read without praying. We begin to read without thanking God. You know, it's just, you know, wow, from that place to where we are now. Well, anyways, so here we are. Heresy is simply, it starts out as just an opinion. We just start talking and, you know, and then it moves into somebody saying, you know what, I feel or I think this is good. And so it gets more, if you want to use the word popular or persuasive. And then as, as people rally around that persuasive word, all of a sudden, the, the, somebody is empowered because heresy has to come through a person. That's why it says prophet, false prophets, false teachers. It has to come through a person yes. who has been given authority, meaning authority to speak into your life. Amen. Jesus said, be careful how you hear. Yes. Amen. Right. So, so anyhow, that's my contribute to heresy. Hey, we may have a thought in our mind. We may talk about it. But if it doesn't line up with Scripture, even if we think it's a good opinion, we have to let it go. Because what what Randy read about men in John chapter 3, I think it's verse 19, men love darkness rather than light. Right, yes. What we were dealing with opinion. We were dealing with truth versus opinion. John the Baptist was coming, preaching the kingdom, of, repent for the kingdom of heaven in his hand. Jesus was coming, preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven in his Amen. hand. The Bible speaks, repent, right, and believe, right, every one of us. What does repent mean? It means to change your mind. So we just don't change our mind with opinion. We have to change our mind with truth. And if we don't believe that, G- well, if we don't believe that the word of God is the truth, is the rock in which we have the foundation of our life, then all we base our life on is somebody else's opinion. Amen. And opinion, <laughs> there's various kinds of them and differing methods of bringing them into our life. And, and opinions, you know, uh, change people. And that's why we have to be guarded. That's why the Bible says in James, don't be, you know, don't be quick to be a teacher because we'll fall under a stricter judgment because it's important for us to understand truth is not an opinion. Truth is truth. That's why the church, the true church is going to be persecuted because opinion is overriding everything else. Okay. I'm going to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're not professing to know everything. No man, woman, or child has the full revelation of all truth. But there are some people out there, and we're going to see it if we get that far tonight, that are uh, being led by demonic spirits, and to see their, uh, Jesus called them, uh, wolves and sheep's clothing, and we do have them in our churches. And if we've been born again, we have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He leads us and guides us in all truth and wisdom. He will put a question mark in our heart. I call it a check. There's just something just doesn't feel right. It's like putting on a pair of old, dirty, nasty, stinking socks on your feet after just taking a shower. It just doesn't seem to fit. Okay, we may not know what it is, but there's nothing wrong with questioning what people are teaching and preaching. We just don't accept that just because somebody's got a reverend beside their name or a PhD or whatever, 
It's We also listen to the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And even those men and women that are anointed men and women called to God, we can still make mistakes and interpret scriptures a lot of times according to our thoughts or our opinions. But it doesn't mean we're false prophets or false teachers. We can still be deceived in certain areas too. Okay, enough with that. Hopefully I don't have everybody scared right now. Uh, Because there are false prophets and there are false teachers among us. Okay, and they are out to deceive us. Okay, so this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this fact, brothers and sisters, this is out of the NIV, that our ancestors were under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, which was the manna. And they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that is the rock of Christ, or that was that rock that Moses struck. Okay, and I won't go through that. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolers or idol worshipers, as some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up and indulged in revelry. In other words, they were partying. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angels. In other words, don't be complaining against your spiritual leaders. Uh, These things happened to them as examples were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. In other words, don't get in pride. No temptation... uh, I'll read it now. I was going to save it for later and kind of close with it, but I guess I'll read it now. No temptation has overtaken you. Um, (laughs) Where did it go? Okay. Okay, here it's back again. I'm not used to working an iPhone. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure. Okay, so we're going to turn over to Numbers. I think I'll do it in the NLT, to Numbers chapter 24, and I'm going to do a lot of reading here. This is the example that uh, Paul was talking about. By now, Balaam realized, this is chapter 24 in Numbers, by now Balaam realized that the Lord was determined to bless Israel, so he did not resort to divination as before. Instead, he turned and looked out towards the wilderness. Now, Balaam's one of those prophets. He was anointed by God. He would get words from God, and he knew he couldn't curse Israel. He had to bless Israel, but he was one of these false prophets that ended up leading Israel that told Balaam how to lead Israel into sin and get the curse to come on them because they sinned. So it was the result of what Israel did. Okay, so let's just go ahead. Uh, instead, he turned and looked out towards the wilderness where he saw the people of Israel cramp, tribe by tribe. Then the Spirit of God came on him, or on Balaam, or I, you know, on Balaam, and still trying to get used to this phone, uh, where he saw the people of Israel cramp, tribe by tribe. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and as this and this is the message he delivered. This is the message of Balaam, son of Beor, 
the message of the man whose eyes see, see clearly, the message of one who hears the words of God, who sees visions from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. Uh, you want me to keep reading? Yeah, if you want to read. Are we in chapter 25 or no, we're in what chapter happened? Two. Okay, go ahead. No, you ready? This is a different verse. Go ahead. The utterance of him who bears the words of God, Numbers 24, 4. Uh, who sees visions of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall he shall break their bones and pierce them with and pierce them with their arrows. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion who shall rouse him, and as a lion who shall rouse him. Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Okay, I'm going to read that out of the NLT because this is a spiritual law right here, and then we haven't talked about this one yet. Like a lion, Israel crouches and lies down, like a lioness who dares to arouse her. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, O Israel, and cursed is everyone who curses you. That comes also from Genesis 12, 3, but that's where it is originally that God said to Abraham, blessed are those that bless you and cursed are those that curse you. But that's where we talk about that. Those that bless Israel shall be blessed. Those that shall curse Israel shall be cursed. So I'm not going to teach on that tonight, but I did want to point that out that that's where we get that verse from. Okay. If you want to read more, if you want me to take over. Then I Balak I figured this phone out. <laughs> verse 10, Numbers 24, 10. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam. And he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place, I said. I will greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. So Balaam said to Balak, Did I not also speak to your messengers when with whom you sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says that I must speak, and now indeed I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do, your people, in the latter days. Okay, so for us... Especially those of us that teach and preach God's word, we're only supposed to teach and preach what God gives us. Nothing more, nothing less. And this is what Balaam was doing. He could only speak what God gave him. He was able to see the dreams, the visions. He was able to prophesy. He was not able to curse Israel. And that's what we want. And those of us who are listening to teachers and preachers, we got to observe them from a mind that is judging by the Word of God. We are responsible for what we're listening to. Dave was bringing that up a little bit earlier, but we are responsible for what we listen to. Now, we may hear some bad teaching or whatever, but we are the ones who have judges what it's good or bad. And like I said, God has, if we've been born again, He's placed the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And like I said, it will just feel like if we're hearing something that's not right, it's going to feel or sense just, it's kind of like, I hate to use the word feeling, but it is still something you sense on the inside. It's just, there's a question mark or a yuck or whatever. And like I used the example, it's like putting crusty old nasty socks on uh, clean feet after you just took a shower. Uh, I, I know that's kind of what that, it's like. Yeah, it's, that's nasty. You just get a yuck sense on the inside that something's not right. You may not always know what it is, but you don't have to accept it. You just can kind of put it up on a shelf, and somewhere along the line, God will open up 
the revelation one way or another, whether this was correct or whether it was wrong or whatever. Sometimes it's our own logical mind that's putting a question mark in there. And like I said, just put it up on a shelf. I don't know anything about that right now. But you don't need to be getting critical of the person whoever's preaching it. But if you start over a period of time seeing this guy's going against the Word of God, then you might want to question what kind of man or woman you're listening to. It's like... uh Maybe this is somebody I'm not supposed to be listening to. So, anyhow, I'm going to, if Dave wants to read more, he can keep reading, or if he wants me to take over, I think I figured the phone out or this version. <laughs> All right, we'll go. Um, verse 15. Verse 15 and, and Numbers 24. It says, So he took up an oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened. The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has knowledge of the Most High, who sees the visions of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and the destiny of the and destroy, sorry, all the sons of Tumulet, and Edom shall be a possession. Seir also his enemies shall be a possession, while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion, and destroy the remains of the city. Then he looked in Amalek, and he took up his oracle and said, Amalek, was first among the nations, but shall be last until he perishes. Then he looked on the Canaanites, and he took up an oracle and said, Firm is your dwelling place, and your nest is set in the rock. Nevertheless, Ken, shall be burned. How long until Asher carries you away captive? Then he took up his oracle and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from the coast of Cyprus, and they shall afflict Asher and afflict Eber, and so shall Amalek until he perishes. So Balaam rose and departed, and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. Okay. So Balaam was a prophet, and he prophesied he could not curse Israel. He could only bless them. But at the same time, he was speaking cursing over all these other nations. Okay, this is not in the Bible. This is extraneous from outside of the Bible that we get this wisdom. But Balaam was the one who showed Balak how to bring a curse on the Israelites. And that is the next chapter, chapter 25. I'll go ahead and read this for a little bit. Moab seduces Israel. While the Israelites were camped at Achaia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relationships with Moab women. They were told not to have sex with other nations. Okay. These women invited them invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods, so the Israelites feasted with them, or other words, they started partying with them and worshiped the gods of Moab. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against them, or against his people. The Lord issued the following command to Moses, seize seize all the ringleaders and execute them before the Lord in broad daylight, so his fierce anger will turn away from the people of Israel. So Moses ordered Israelite judges, each of you must put to death the men under your authority who have joined in worshiping Baal of Peor. So sexual sins, like I said, this was given to us for an example. So the sexual sins is something we do need to repent of. Uh, God did not say Sodom and Gomorrah was okay. He destroyed them. He and these people were partying, having sexual relationships besides somebody with their Israelite wife, and it brought damnation on them. Okay, as I was saying earlier, Jesus came to set us free from whatever we temptations we 
are because all of us have to deal with temptations. Jesus had to deal with temptations. How did Jesus resist the devil? He resisted him the three times he personally appeared to him with the word of God. But that was not the last time that Jesus was tempted by the devil. It says the devil left him for a more opportune time. For that time forth, the devil never personally appeared again. He only operated through other men and women that were already here on the planet. So many of our temptations, we may never physically see a demon. We may never physically know they're in the room or whatever, but they're here. The angels are here. The Holy Spirit's here. But we are the ones that choose by our actions and by our words, which we yield to. Now, the devil has legal right to bring temptations our way. But we have all legal rights to resist them, too, because it says resist the devil, (laughs) and he will flee. So it is our responsibility to do the resisting. It is not God's. Now, he gave us tools and weapons, and that's why we have Bible studies like this, and we teach stuff like this, is to find out what our tools and our weapons are. Number one weapon he gave us was even whenever we were baby Christians, most of us probably didn't know any, or at least I didn't. Some of you might have had some word in you. I didn't know any word. I didn't even, I didn't know anything. Uh, I could tell you a couple of Bible stories, but I did have the name of Jesus. Unfortunately, nobody ever told me that. <laughs> so the number one way you can resist the devil is by using the name of Jesus against him. Whenever your temptation comes, no. In the name of Jesus, get out of here. You may not have any Bible verses you can quote, but whenever you say the name of Jesus, you just ended up throwing the whole word of God at him at one point because Jesus is the word. So whenever you say the name of Jesus, that is the name of, that is above every name. I don't care what temptation, what sickness, what ailment, whatever it is, you just threw the whole word of God at him whenever you say the name of Jesus, which that is a good study in itself, just going through the New Testament and seeing the power that is in the name of Jesus. But that's not tonight. So we read that scripture over in ten, or, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, that he's made a way for us to be delivered out of every temptation, test, or trial that the devil may bring our ways. Now, sometimes we may have brought the circumstance on ourselves by things that we've done, like these men did here. They were having sex, worshiping the Moabites, gods, the Baal, which Baal was one of those ones they sacrificed the babies to. So there you go with the abortion issue that, hey, that was one of the things God brought judgment. He was angry at his people because they were worshiping sacrificing babies to foreign gods and also having sex in front of these foreign gods and worship. And so God was angry at them. God does not like us doing those things either. Now, why is things called sin? Or why does God hate sin? Because it is a perversion of way God has made us to be. And the devil is, he is only a perverter. He can only take what God has already created and pervert it to be something else. Like God created sex between a husband and wife, and it is supposed to be good. And he called it good whenever he created woman and gave them to to Adam. And Adam says, oh, wow, woman, and this is good. So God made sex, but the devil perverted it to cause us to do things with it that God did not design us to do. Anything that is sin brings harm or hurt to human beings. That's why it is sin. That's why it's wrong. That's why God tells us not to do that. It's don't do this because you're only going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt other people. And the unfortunate thing about sin is there is no sin that only hurts oneself. It, It always hurts other people. And whenever people are into whatever sin it may be, and I used the example whenever I gave my testimony about me being an alcoholic, that was the God in my life, and it was the answer to all my problems. I couldn't see it's creating all my problems or most of my problems. But I was turning on 
other people to the God that was in my life. So whatever we worship or whatever we're, sins we're involved in, we usually try to bring other people in to try to make ourselves feel better about what we're doing. It's, see, this is just normal. Everybody does it or whatever. So we promote those sins. So sin is never just a personal thing that only harms, harms us. It also harms the people around us. Uh, and that's why God hates sin is because it brings harm to ourselves and harm to other people. It is something he did not create us to do. He did not create us to boil our brains or pick our livers with booze or <laughs> uh, cigarettes or get lung cancer or whatever. God did not bring the punishment. We are just a result of the things that we are doing to ourselves. Yeah, so, God, we're sowing seeds that are the wrong kind. Yeah, and we've brought that up over and over, over in yep. Galatians. Yep. So God does want to set us free. In fact, let's go back to those scriptures. Like I said, that's what I wanted to originally close with, but I already read them, so see if I can find them again. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay, the other weapon, main weapon that we have, which you heard us praying in tongues, but we won't get into that one tonight because we pray for things that we don't even know or understand. So that's why I say it's kind of like the perfect prayer. But a lot of people have not been baptized or don't know how to use their prayer language yet. So that one may lead off to some other night, but... The other thing we have is the Word of God. Remember, Jesus, he resisted with the Word of God. So whatever we're coming up against. Uh, over in Peter, it says that God has given us uh, these precious and exceeding great and precious promises so that we may live in all godliness and honesty. And so he gave us promises in the Word. So we take the Word of God and we resist the devil with the Word. We put that Word in our mouth. It is a two-edged sword. It is just like God speaking the Word out of His mouth when we put His Word in our mouth hmm. and we speak it out. It is a two-edged sword. It's alive and powerful and stronger than any two-edged sword. So it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So that's how we resist the devil is with the name of Jesus. If you're a baby Christian, you don't know any scriptures yet. But once you get to know in scriptures, then you take those scriptures and you just whack the heck out of the devil with them or the adversary. Okay, so this is the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, I'll start in verse 11. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us to li who live at the end of this age. If you think or you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. So don't go getting puffed up saying, I can't fall. That's the fastest way of falling. <laughs> pride puffs up. Okay. Uh, pride comes before a fall. So we don't want to say, hey, there's no way I can ever fall. No, we don't walk in fear but we don't walk in pride either. The temptation in your life are, diff are, are no different from what others experience. So you're not the only one being tempted, tempted or tested with whatever you're going through. There's other people out there in the world already gone through it or going through it. But that's what the devil likes to do to us. He likes to put us and get us one-on-one -on -one that you're the only one that can think or feel or whatever this way. No, you're not the only one going through it. It's like me tonight. I came up here tired, wore out, just ugh, didn't feel like doing it, honestly. But we're called to be faithful, and I also know that usually once I get into the Word, feelings and emotions, they're kind of fickled. One minute you can be up and the next minute down, but you can be down and get into the Word of God and start praising and worshiping God and Next thing, the uh, emotions and the feelings can change. Okay, so we come into the house of God and give the sacrifices of praise. Well, sacrifice is something, it's easy to, whenever everything's hunky-dory, to worship and praise God, but it's whenever you don't feel like praising and worshiping God, that's when it becomes a sacrifice. Okay, so that's another weapon that you have, too, is the praise and worship. Okay, verse 12. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fail. The temptation in your life 
are no different from what others are experiencing. God is, God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So right there is a promise. No matter what you're going through, it says he's faithful, and he will show you a way out of this thing. But you've got to seek him, okay? Not do what you think you ner- supposed to off the top of your head. No, you spend time. Father, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Learn how to talk, but also learn how to listen. That's why I say praying in the Spirit is kind of like the perfect thing. It is God the Holy Spirit praying to God the Father, and we're supposed to interpret. And like I say, whenever I pray in the Spirit, I don't pay attention to what's coming out of my mouth. I just kind of pay attention to what's going on in the inside of me. And it's like, ah, okay, that's what I need to do, or that's how we get the Bible teachings or whatever. It's how I pretty much get everything it's, is by praying in the Spirit. So if you haven't learned that, we're probably going to lead you into baptism of the Holy Spirit tonight. <laughs> so anyhow, so my dear get friends. On it. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, uh, I second that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. is It, it is not, well, some theologians call it the second act of grace. Um because they, they call it that because we receive salvation by faith. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and our Savior. But the Comforter is the Holy Spirit who comes into your heart. Right? As soon as you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and seals you for eternity. But Jesus even said, you know, after he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit. He said, now, don't go out and do anything yet. You need to go to Jerusalem and you need to wait till you be endued with power from on high. And that power is a spiritual power to fight spiritual battles. And 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 in that understanding of that, to be to pray in the spirit, it's so simple. Like you were born through your parents. If your parents speak Chinese, you speak Chinese. That's your natural tongue. Listen to me. That's your natural tongue. If you were German, you speak German. I was born in America, and I speak English. That is my native tongue. That's not my second language, right? I don't have a second language. Maybe I should, but I don't. But the fact of the matter is, I'm trying to make a point here. The Bible says that when we're born again, we're not born by the will of flesh, okay? We're not born by the will of man, but by the will of God. So we're born in the Spirit. So wouldn't it make sense to have a spiritual tongue, a native language? Come on. I feel like speaking in tongues right now. (laughs) Because that is, the Bible says, it's not a freaky thing. It's a natural thing. The problem is the Pentecostal church and the charismatic church blew it up to be a, a goal to reach instead of a tool to use. I said he, we blew it up to make a goal to reach. So in Pentecostal churches, they get the Holy Ghost. Everybody goes crazy. They clap their hands, and then nobody prays in the Spirit after because there's no teaching after. Yes. Paul said, I wish that you all prayed in tongues. Amen. All right? Why? I wonder why Paul said those words. Okay? This is an intellectual giant. This is a man who, could, who knew Greek, who knew Hebrew, who knew Aramaic, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees by his own admission. And yet, he counted all that dung. Why? Because he knew to truly understand the Word of God, the ways of God, it has to be taught to us by the Holy Spirit like Jesus taught the disciples when they walked with him. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. That word another means one just like me. That's where you get the Trinity. Anyways, I don't want to go down this road. Oh, I do, but you know. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, having a spiritual language is a normal and natural part of your spiritual life so that you can commune with God. And I'll finish with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2 says, But he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. Okay, did you hear that? Not unto men but unto God. Amen. How be it, in the Spirit, he speaks 
mysteries. Divine I'll stop there because I go somewhere else. But I'm telling you, I'm encouraging you. People that are listening on the podcast, people that are listening online on Facebook, I want to encourage you. If you haven't prayed in the Spirit in a long time and you thought it was a goal to attain and you set it on the shelf, get it back off the shelf Amen. because it hasn't left you. You don't have to pray another prayer. Just just pray in the Spirit. Amen. You know, you remember how that went, right? It's not, it's not a mental thing. It is engaging God in prayer. And one thing you can do is ask to be filled with the Spirit again because Jesus Amen. said we need to continually be being filled. So come on out there. The baptism of the Holy Ghost has such a freaky tag on it. I want to take that label off the baptism. Of, we're not stupid people. We're in a, we, we use our brains. The Pentecostal people, the charismatic people, the people that do speak in tongues are labor, labeled, have been labeled by the world and by the church, I should say. Holy rollers, weirdos, all this kind of stuff. And the fact of the matter is, there are intellectual giants that pray in the Holy Spirit Amen. who have master's degrees, who are doctors and lawyers. If you don't believe me, I'm telling you, they're out there. Yes, amen. So... This is not something that you do to make a goal. This is something you God has given you to, it all boils down to this, communion and relationship with God, who is, by the way, not a man. He is a spirit. And when we were born again, we were born of the spirit, and our spirit was made alive. Yes, amen. Okay, so I'm done. I'm not, you know, I'll just get on my soapbox. But the Holy Ghost deserves to be embraced and the language that he gives you deserves to be spoken because Jesus paid an awful price for us to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, and he, re- he quoted the scriptures over in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to read a verse out of Ephesians 6, and this is part of the prayer armor. And, well, I just said it, it's the prayer armor. But we won't read the whole armor of God tonight. But verse 18, it says, And pray in the Spirit. And he already quoted 1 Corinthians 14, where praying in the Spirit and praying in the tongues is one and the same. So it says, and this is out of the NIV. The King James is a little bit muddled, but it says the same thing if we want to. Excuse me. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Go ahead. With all kinds of prayer (laughs) and request. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So that's not a suggestion that he's telling us there. It says pray on all occasions in the spirit. That's more or less a command. That's not just a suggestion. So the prayer language is not just one of those ones, take it or leave it. It is an integral part of the armor of God that God gave us. Okay, now we're not going to be able to do a bunch of teaching on it tonight. If you have never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, there is only two requirements to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. One is you must be born again. So, Amen. if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can receive him right now. Jesus, come into my life. Help me take over my life. Show me what I need to change in my life, because you can't repent of all your sins. You don't know all the sins that are in your life. It's, as I'm finding out 40-some years later, I think I'm doing pretty good, and all of a sudden he says, okay, now I want you to work on I'd have never, if he had told me that was a sin 45 years ago, it's like, you got to be kidding me. So that is a part of the process. <clears throat> that is also part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes, Jesus comes to baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, that fire is a twofold purpose. One of that purposes is, is to burn out that dross, burn out those bad things in our life. And that's part of praying in the Spirit. As we're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Heavenly Father is revealing things that we need to work on. He's showing us how to do it. It's not only he tells us don't do things, it says he shows us ways out of it. So it's not only he will point the thing that needs to change, he will start showing you what steps you need to take to be delivered or set free from that thing. Most cases, we are not instantly... Uh, and have one of those miraculous things or whenever deliver, have a temptation again. It's usually a process of, okay, 
Now we, we're going to work on this area. Quit watching this. Quit listening to this. Whatever it may be. Go here, go there. Whatever he tells you to do. He's showing you step by step how to receive your deliverance. Okay, back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So number one requirement is you must be born again. So receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you shall be saved or you shall be born again. You shall be delivered. Okay. A second part of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is just having a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he, the Father, he will give you the Holy Spirit. So if you ask to be filled, he will fill you. You can do that Ephesians 3 prayer on your own if you want to. But you just, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And whenever you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, us Pentecostals, we used to teach you how to speak in tongues. <clears throat> and for most people, if they had an emotional experience, they would speak in tongues. But I didn't have an emotional experience, so I was waiting for God to start making me make sounds or move my tongue or whatever, whatever I was expecting. So it's like, I'm standing here. They're all, they're all, God, what's wrong with me? Well, I didn't realize I must do the speaking. He gives me the ability to speak. So for me, I only had two syllables at that time. Whenever I finally did start praying in tongues, it's like I had two syllables. Yabba. I don't know what they were. I used to be able to tell you. but So I just made two syllables up, and that's what I spoke. And it's like the devil come. Well, you just made that up? Yeah, it says I made that up. It's like, hey, the Holy Spirit, he gave me the ability to do that. And for some of us that were taught anti-tongues and all this stuff, we might have roadblocks in our mind that keep us from having a full-blown language. <laughs> our lights freak out here if you're watching this live on Facebook. <laughs> Maybe it's the power of God. I don't know. It's the word. We're... <laughs> no, anyhow, it's kind of freaky. The lights go out on us. <laughs> so anyhow... I only had those two syllables, and the devil would come along, and that's how I resisted them. It's like, hey, I will pray with my spirit, and I will pray with my understanding. That's how I resisted them, and then I'd yabba, <laughs> whatever. And eventually, the more I did that, eventually my language kept just like a newborn baby. They can't come out speaking <laughs> natural, full-blown <laughs> English like Dave did. <laughs> they came out making all yeah. kinds of stuff, yeah, like mama, dad, or whatever. <laughs> it, it even came out that plain. So maybe oh, it, it, newborn babes and whatever. Yeah, when I was have problems like me. But just continually practice it. Anything you do gets better and better. And for most people, even the ones that have the emotional experience, usually that is a praise language that they come out with. And the only time they ever use their prayer language is whenever they have an emotional experience. That's what we're trying to get you away from. Use your prayer language on purpose. What do you feel like it or don't feel like it? Because what I found out, the times I don't feel like it is the times I need to use it the most. So it is one of those weapons for resisting the devil. And it says, pray with the Spirit on all occasions, not just when you feel like it, but when you don't feel like it. That's offering up the sacrifice. And it says, as we pray in our unknown language, that we are praying in the Holy Spirit, but it says we are edifying, we are charging our spirits up. It's over in uh, Jude, it says we're building ourselves up in our most holy faith. We're so, going to have a table left after tonight. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. So, anyhow, God. the prayer language is for each and every one of us. Anybody who has ever been born again and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a way we keep recharging ourselves and being refilled. One of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways we keep being refilled with that Holy Spirit is by praying in unknown tongues. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and let him uh, close us tonight. Amen. Well, that's exciting, man. We learned tonight about beware of, of people who are false prophets and false teachers. We learned about the word heresy and how it is an opinion that becomes, I'll put it in quotes, a truth that is followed by many, and that's why we have to surround ourselves with the Word of God. We, all, we learned about escaping temptation. So, God's dealing with a lot of stuff. Tonight, and we learned that we can escape temptation. Amen. And finally, we learned of the importance of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, that it is not an accessory on a car. Go buy a car, I think I'll have power windows. Now, power windows are not an accessory. 
So, being a Christian, having the ability to commune with God, yes, we can do it in our natural language all of our life. We can commune through the scriptures. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. But there is a promise from the Father that Jesus died. He shed his blood for, not just the salvation of our souls to heaven, but the invitation to have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And I can take you to a scripture right now. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think it's verse 14. It's a benediction thing that we use. But Paul wrote one of his last words was, uh, the love of God, the fellowship, or, or, or the, the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion, our fellowship with the Holy Spirit yes. be with you always. And so it's, this, it's not an idea. It's the truth that presently, in order to commune with God, we have to know the language of God, the ways Amen. of God. And so I encourage you, and I say to you, on Facebook Live, and I say to you here on the podcast, receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's exactly how they did it. That's exactly as easy as it comes. Receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we thank you tonight. We bless you for the love you have for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you spent your life for the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you brought us salvation, and we thank you for that so much. We bless you for salvation. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ of Nazareth, your Son. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. But Hallelujah. before the baptism, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that yes. was given to us. On the very moment we confess Jesus yes, as Lord. Lord of our life, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And now I say to you, like I say always, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face and favor to shine upon you. The Lord lift up yes. his countenance to you, awesome. turn his face towards you, and yes. give you shalom. Home, peace, yes. wholeness, healing, and prosperity, safety, good health, nothing missing, you'll nothing find broken. it, nothing broken either, <laughs> he will heal it, he will mend it, in Jesus' name, amen, Amen. and amen. So, All right, guys, uh, we appreciate you joining this podcast, Jesus and Current Events, with Randon Magaki, praise the Lord forever. Randy. <laughs> he said it. I didn't. Glory to God. Yeah, it is. It's Randy McGacky. Hey, guys, we have the ability for you to give um, now to Brookville House of Worship. If you text GIVE to 814-482-2777, that's texting to GIVE to 814-482-2777. That would be greatly appreciated to support uh, these podcasts and everything we do here at Brookville House of Worship. If you want to know, know what we do here at Brookville House of Worship, you can go to brookvillehouseofworship.com or you can check us out on Facebook at Brookville House of Worship. You can also write a check to us, Brookville House of Worship, 227 Main Street, Brookville, Pennsylvania, 15825. And before you send that check or before you give that text, we want to say thank you because we really do appreciate it. We bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time on Jesus and Current Events. Later, later. Bye.